You know, whenever I go newly to any place, uh, like um, any new town or anything of the sort, uh, I just uh, make certain that if I get half a chance, I speak about Christ. You get what I mean? Like, uh, not, uh, not an encouraging message or some kind of a thought-provoking message for the congregation, but to speak of Him. And so this morning, what I'd like to speak on is um, the littleness of Christ. When I say that, many uh, are taken aback because they say, we've always heard of Christ as the one who is great, mighty, powerful, altogether lovely, and so on and so forth. And you're talking about the littleness of Christ. What are you saying? You know, when we say little, what I mean is that there is another word. If I use that, then you'll understand. Be little. You see, when, you, when someone belittles another, However great, however nice that other person may be, something is said to cut him down to size or reduce him to nothing. And that is what happened in the life of Christ. And I'm going to show you from the beginning uh, some signs in the Bible as to how he seems little or he was deemed as little in the eyes of the world. And especially in the eyes of Satan who hated him. Okay? Now, to begin with, I'm going to speak about this fact that the, the word belittle is to deliberately try to bring him down and take away everything that is positive and beautiful about the person and strip him of everything. That's what the world tried to do. That's what the devil tried to do when the Lord Jesus Christ was walking on earth. And for the, particularly in the three and a half years that he ministered the word of God. And he reached out and touched people during that time. Now, take, a, take for instance, his birth. Now, I do hope that uh, someone has got the scriptures. I gave it to uh, Zarima. Did you get the scriptures? No? All right, doesn't matter then. Okay, it's, it's Micah. Chapter 5 and verse 2. Okay, Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says this. I, I, I'll read it for you then. Micah 5 and 2. What you've got there is about Bethlehem in Judea, Judah. Okay, Bethlehem, Judah. If somebody could find it. You may read it straight away. Can but, you, but thou, Bethlehem. yes, tell me. But thou, Bethlehem. Ephrata. Yeah. Though you are small among the clans of Judah. Yeah. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Okay. All right. Thou, you, I'm quoting from the old King James Version. Thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little, among the thousands of Judah, it means that in Judah or Judea, you've got thousands of cities, you know, whatever, whatever you call it, cities at that time. All right. Of all of these, Bethlehem is little, mean thou at the least. And that's where Christ was born. You get what I mean? Thou Bethlehem, you Judea. Yet out of thee shall come forth the one who's going to be the ruler in this world, the mighty king, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. And incidentally, if in that same passage, if you look a little later, round about, uh, see, I, I'm going on like this because I have a little problem with my eyes and I can't see too well. And I depend upon the person who puts the, what you call it, scripture on the screen or something, but that doesn't seem to be possible today. But it, there is a verse which, which talks about um, who is that person. Now, okay, you get it in G Genesis chapter uh, 10 also, and you get it over here. 
Nimrod. You've heard the name Nimrod before? Yes. N-I-M-R-O-D, okay, Nimrod. Now that name Nimrod comes there, very strange. In the passage where you read about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got Nimrod mentioned there. Very strange, I say, because when you go back to Genesis chapter 10, Nimrod is mentioned as a mighty hunter, mighty warrior, mighty hunter. And the Bible says over there that his kingdom, the first mention of kingdom in, in creation, first mention of kingdom, that is Nimrod's kingdom. And in, when you read the various uh, cities that are mentioned over there, you've got Babel, Babel, from which you get Babylon. And you've got, uh, you, you've got uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, pardon? It doesn't matter, okay. Number of cities there. Now, if you study up those cities, you find that this man was the first great world emperor. All right, now why am I saying that? Because where the Lord Jesus Christ is born, it's, it's a small place, first of all, and secondly, you've got a Nimrod close by there. Right, when the Lord Jesus was born, do you remember who was there who wanted to finish him? Anybody tell me? Herod wanted to finish. The wise men came and said, where is he born, king of the Jews? And he says, you show me, I want to come and worship him. Didn't he say that? But he didn't want to worship him. He couldn't get him because God commanded those uh, three men, the angels of the Lord commanded the three wise men to go another way. And Herod was furious. What did he do? He killed all the boys under two years. Can you imagine that? Now that's the same principle. You've got Nimrod over there and you've got this. And if it's possible for you to turn to Revelation chapter 12. And somebody read it, Revelation chapter 12. Now in the fourth verse, have you got it? All right, Revelation 12 and in the fourth verse you find, and I saw also another sign it was the great red dragon. Have you got that in your Bible? If you haven't got it, put it in. All right. The great red dragon. My goodness, now who is that? Now earlier, the, the verses that precede that is about Israel going to have a child. She was heavy with child, as, as it were. And that's, you, you've got Israel, you've got Mary, and you've got the child, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now the next verse, verse 4 says, and I saw another sign, and that was the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Am I right? Am I quoting it right? Ten horns. Eh? Yeah. And this great red dragon stood before the woman. Does it say that in your Bible? He stood before the woman with his mouth wide open, ready to devour the child as soon as it is born. Who is that child? Read verse 5, somebody. And she brought forth? And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Yes. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. All right, that's enough. Now, in all the words that you read in that verse, there are only two things said about the Lord Jesus Christ describing who he is, apart from the fact that he's going to rule. It says that he's going to rule. It's a man-child, right or not? Yes. Eh? She brought forth a man-child. What else? I thought you'll talk about the miracles. No, no, we're not talking about that. I thought you'll talk about the death and the resurrection. No, that's not in it. Then what? He, she brought forth a man-child, and the last line says, he was caught up to glory. Hallelujah. You got what I mean? You get what I mean? That's Lord, that's Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he came for. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh and caught up to glory. Thanks be to God. He's up there now. Yes or no? Yes. Somebody smile at least. And he's up there. And where is he? Tell me. He's at the right hand of God. 
seated at the right hand of God, waiting impatiently almost. I'm sorry about saying that, but waiting impatiently for the word from the Father. What word? Okay, the time is up, you can go. They're all waiting. In Covenant Chapel and every other chapel, they're waiting. Go and get them. You get what I mean? That's what it says. But the great red dragon was there. Now, let's put that aside. That's about his birth. <clears throat> All right, somebody tell me, uh, when he came and appeared at the age of 30, you get my point? At the age of 30, he began his ministry. And he came and appeared to the crowd over there, John the Baptist standing there, right? He has not yet had a very personal transaction with the Lord Jesus at all. But he kept saying, he's coming, he's coming. He that comes after me is greater than me and what not. Now the Lord Jesus actually comes before him. And the Spirit of God shows him that this is the one. And how would he welcome the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the mighty Son of God and he's come and he's introducing, how would he, how would he have introduced him? How would you have introduced him? You know, if Alexander the Great came riding on his famous horse, the Bekelos, and if he, if he came and, oh, there would be runners before him, yes or no? Trumpeters, runners, the sounding uh, of the word that the emperor is coming in. All right. But no, what did John say? Somebody tell me. If you remember, you tell me. All right, I'll give you the first word. Okay, don't think too hard. I can see the struggle on your faces. Uh, all right, I'll give you the first word. Behold, the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Who will introduce a person, mighty God like this, saying he's the Lamb. If you go to Revelation chapter 5, don't go. But if you go to Revelation 5, the angels of God are saying, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And John was caught up to glory and there he was and the angels are saying, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John says, I looked and I saw a lamb. He, he looked for what? The lion. the lion. That's what he looks like to the angels. That's what he looks like to the demons. He is the lion, the mighty conqueror. But to the believer he looks like what? The Lamb of God, slain from the foundations of the world. That's why you're going to worship him now. A little later you're going to break bread, are you not? That's what happened to him. The Lamb that was slain. What a beautiful thing. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was introduced, he was not introduced as a mighty emperor or king or whatever it is. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. You, you know, the sheep, the lamb, they are the simplest animals, I think. Hmm. I, I think they, the sheep don't even know their sense of direction. And the sheep, Dr. One Nambudri Pad, there was a doctor, he said this, he says, sheep have stiff neck. If you don't believe it, you go and ask them. Okay? <laughs> sheep have stiff neck. And sheep can't see far off because all they need to do is see, see from here to the grass. Isn't that right? So no need of long distance, uh, what you call it, whatever it is. And then he says, sheep don't have any sense of danger coming. That's the kind of sheep. He says, behold the lamb. You're describing the Lord, the glorious creator of heaven and earth. And you're calling him a lamb. And I think believers would love that more than anybody else in creation. You know why? Tell me why. Somebody say. Because he died for you. That's, that's as simple as that. Don't look stunned. I, I'm one who keeps asking questions because I don't know, you know. That, that's, that's the secret. I don't know. I keep asking questions. All right. Doesn't matter. I tell you, you love him because he's the lamb who took your place. Upon whose head 
the lord god of heaven pronounced all your sins and laid it upon him and slew him he was sacrificed as the lamb never mind we'll go a little more into the three and a half years and what do you read about him you know what we read in the three and a half years he had an insignificant family you all agree or not you don't know what to say i know that the way you look at me you don't know what to say uh, right insignificant family you know when those people came and heard him many of those pharisees sadducees and all what kind of wisdom is this that's the way they went on and then in two different passages in one passage it says he is but a carpenter and we know his sisters his brothers and his family and all that he is only a carpenter and then in matthew chapter 10 it says he is only a carpenter son father is a carpenter son is a carpenter that seems to be the family thing that's all he is you know the lord never showed himself as somebody mighty always one who was humble and broken let this mind be in you which was also in christ have you read that anywhere yes. ezekiel chapter no it's not in ezekiel it's in philippians chapter 2 i'm just trying to confuse you a little bit philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says let this mind be in you which was also in christ who being in the form of god finish it he thought it not robbery to be equal with god but he made himself of no reputation we'll come to that a little later you see now that's the way the lord jesus lived and there he was it says his family was insignificant and then what you find is about his family will you please turn now to john chapter 7 now once you come to john chapter 7 i'll keep you there for a little while john chapter 7 and you would like to read from verse 1 okay all right will you read somebody read after this jesus went around in galilee yes he did not want to go about in judea because the jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him okay so he didn't go to judea he was he stayed put in nazareth right then carry on but when the jewish festival of tabernacles was near okay watch it now carefully jesus's brothers said to him yeah who said brothers. the brothers now i'm talking about his family right his brothers said to him what leave galilee and go to judea why so that your disciples there will see the works you do okay no one who wants to become a public figure <coughs> Okay you see his own brothers I mean you're talking about his family now right his own brothers they said to him what are you doing here if you want to show yourself and if you want to make a name for yourself go to judea show yourself to everybody they didn't because the last line there did you read it since you are doing these things show yourself and then even his own brothers did not believe in him you see that's it all around you were seeing the miracles you were hearing the gracious words that come from his mouth you've you've seen miracles happening and you've seen the gentleness of this this person who walks about among us in sandals and yet they didn't believe his own brothers didn't believe Yeah my time has not yet come this my time is not now but for you every bit of time everything everything is time for you but my time has to come and a little later the lord jesus christ said finally my hour is come you see everything that happened in the life of christ happened according to the plan and the purpose of god everything that happened 
even when he when he died even when he rose again and even when he comes again agreed with me he's coming again and there's a time for that now his brothers didn't believe on him and they they not only didn't believe on him they belittled him by saying no one sits in the house and expects to become famous now what are you doing here you go show yourself he they knew that if he went and showed himself those people will grab him and probably want to kill him so his brothers even didn't believe on him living and breathing the same air eating at the same table walking about with each other and going through day after day for 30 years and yet they they were blind and they could not see that this is the son of god what a pity i i believe a lot of people are like that in this world they're blind that what scripture says they are blind they can't see even if they hear the word of god it nothing happens until the holy spirit convicts them in their hearts with the word of almighty god until god does something in their lives i was 20 years old when i accepted the lord jesus christ and that was a good 1953 when the dinosaurs were moving about <laughs> that you don't believe i know the way you laugh you know i got saved in 1953 june 15th and what a day that was but until that time why didn't i get saved I was in a Christian family I was in a Christian church I was singing in the choir I did everything that I could possibly do and what what else and I didn't murder anybody didn't do anything of that sort and yet I wasn't saved but a day came June 15th 1953 what a day that was I heard the preaching before that I heard somebody here somebody there and different kind of thing and yet I had not surrendered my eyes were not opened yet but when that June 15th came that night I tell you I couldn't help it nobody said raise your hand or come forward or you know kneel down nothing of that sort at the end of a of a of a kind of a musical night which I myself arranged for all had gone the whole crowd had gone only two or three of us were rearranging the chairs then i dropped on my knees nobody said do it i dropped on my knees at one of those benches and then i prayed and i said lord i'm struggling inside i'm struggling inside i don't know what to do i i don't know how to do it the preacher say open your heart believe and receive Christ as your savior he will come and i said lord how do i do that how will he do that you know all sorts of questions in my mind then after that i don't know somehow i felt at 8:30 that night i know the time i became calm and then it just sort of it seemed as if the lord opened my eyes and i opened my heart and i said lord i don't know how you will do it I don't know what I should do but I'm willing to I'm willing to confess that I'm a sinner Lord Jesus come into my heart you won't believe it like a great burden fell off my shoulder my heart was free I went home almost like I'm almost ran home kind of thing I was so happy and I tell you a uh, 60 I don't know how many years it is since 1953 I got saved it's about 50 years something eh anyway but I st I'm still happy inside how do you like that don't worry about how many years I'm still happy and I tell you the lord did a wonderful thing and it's still I would like to go through that experience 10000 times what a day when he came in and he's never left me and he doesn't leave and come back leave and come back because when i'm i was born again i i heard about that later and i studied that later that i'm born again 
by the Holy Spirit of God. And I've come into a union with Christ by the Spirit, which can never be separated. Thanks be to God. Oh God, we pray that our friends, our, our relatives, our loved ones who do not know the Lord, pray for them. Pray that they may come to know Christ as their personal savior. All right, that is about the Lord Jesus Christ and about his brothers, okay? And then, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ also said something about himself. And you would feel the littleness. And uh, those disciples used to frequently ask him, Lord, where do you dwell? You know what his answer was? Somebody remember? The foxes have holes. The birds of the air have their nest. But the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. And where did he go then? At the end of that, at the end of that chapter 7 of, I'm talking about chapter uh, 7. Uh, at the end of that chapter, it goes into chapter 8. And verse 1 of chapter 8 says, he went into to the mountain among the trees Lord where did you lay your head I don't know he had nowhere to lay his head on another occasion I'll tell you another thing about the littleness of Christ and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter were pretty close you know that don't you and they talked together and they shared with one another. Christ had to rebuke him, encourage him, did all sorts of things. All of a sudden, Peter comes running into the room and says, Lord, you know what? He says, what? The tax collectors have come. And Peter, you know how he is. He'll cry for nothing at all. He'll cry. And here he was shivering. The tax collectors have come. The Lord Jesus Christ said to him, okay, Simon, you do one thing. You go fishing. He says, but the tax collectors have come. You go fishing, I'm telling you. You, you know, you, sometimes you can't understand the Lord's commands to you, can you? You, do, you don't understand. But why? No, that's not the question. I'm telling you, go fishing. So he went. And the Lord said, and the first fish that you catch, you know what you do, Simon? Open the mouth. You don't open your mouth. <laughs> you, you will get into trouble. Open the mouth of that fish. And then you will find a coin over there. And that will be enough for you and me. How do you like that? Peter, I tell you, came back. Not with that fish or anything. He came back with that coin and said, Master, this is what. He was going to pay them. He didn't. I don't think he had a bank balance the Lord Jesus. The whole of creation is his, but I don't think he, 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 he acted as if he possesses something, you know. We behave like that. I possess this, that, and forget about that. If you possess anything that is of any value, it's the Spirit of God who is in you. Agreed with me? Say amen or something. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Praise be to God. What a thing to possess this. Others don't know. They don't know that this is, is like a casket. I'm growing old. That's what I'm told. <laughs> I mean, not that I don't believe it or don't agree with it. I, I am growing old, agreed with that. But even in this old man, it's the Spirit of God who is dwelling in me from June 15th, 1953. You happy or not? Amen. How about you? How about you? Yes. You agree with me yes. that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. I tell you, we have this treasure. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. An earthen vessel can break, can it not? Yes. And yet this mighty power not atomic power, but this mighty dynamic power of the Holy Spirit is inside earthen vessels. What a thing. Praise be to God. 
And I tell you, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be a child of God. He had no wealth, no riches, no family. And those Pharisees and scribes, they said to him again and again, look, he's only a carpenter. Where does he get all this, all this from? Now come to John chapter 7 again. And look at verse uh, 15. John chapter 7. You've got something there about the Lord Jesus speaking. The Jews, they were amazed and asked, how did this guy get such... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who, who was amazed? The Jews. The Jews, I mean those who heard him. They were unbelievers. They didn't believe in him, okay? How did this man yeah. get such learning without having been taught? Okay, now I'll tell you, in my Bible it goes like this. How doth this man know letters having never learned? That's the King James Version. How does this man, that means they heard him speaking and they were dumbfounded. What a man, where did he get all this? How does this man speak all this wisdom having never learned? And you know what that word, what that word in Greek is? How does this man know letters, not letters, how does this man know grammata? That's the Greek word over there. And that's the word from which we get grammar. In other words, they're saying, how does he know any kind of learning at all? He's never sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He never sat at the feet of any philosopher or, or, or PhD. No, not at all. And yet, how does he get this? He is himself wisdom, the wisdom of God. Say amen about that. He is. He is. He is the sum total of the wisdom and the power of God. There is no wisdom besides him. That's him. Praise be to God. Nobody can understand, nobody can fathom or, or understand the wisdom and the understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's him. And yet, he became nothing. You know, talking about this kind of a thing, the Lord Jesus, the, the worst part of it is which pains my heart is this. I'm going to read it one by one to you, okay? Now, if you will read with me. Now, John chapter 7, uh, 7 verse 20. Take a look at that. John chapter 7, verse 20. Somebody read that. You are demon possessed. You are? Who said that? The crowd. The crowd said, they came to him, they hear what he spoke, they see his miracles, they look at his face, a face full of the grace of God, and he's, they call him what? Demon You're demon possessed. That's one verse. Okay, go to another verse. Chapter 8 of John's Gospel and verse 48. What does it say? The Jews, the Jews said what? Answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? Okay, now wait, wait, wait. There's an increment over there. <laughs> Am I right or not? First they say, you're demon possessed. Now they say, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan? By the way, what's wrong with a Samaritan? Somebody tell me. Is it nice to be a Samaritan? No. Why? All right, don't struggle, I'll tell you. This Samaritan, uh, a Samaritan is from Samaria. That's profound, isn't it? Okay, he's from Samaria. Now, why do the Jews look at, they would see a Samaritan and turn that side and spit. Why would they do that? Because the Samaritans were Jews and Gentiles whom the Assyrians brought and put them there, the poor ones, the beggars and all sort of, put them all together and that was Samaria and they were the offspring of Jew and Gentile. Therefore, the Jew thought he was a pure Jew, and these are not pure Jews, so they would spit. 
And now they are calling Christ what? A Samaritan. Did we not rightly say that? That you're a Samaritan and that you are, what you call it, uh, you are demon possessed? Okay, read verse 52 now. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now we know. We rightly say, and they say that. Now we know what? That you are demon possessed. See, they don't want to stop at this. This is what pains me most. It is this one thing that they take and they are rubbing it in the minds of everybody. What is that now? Look at chapter 10 and verse 20. And look at the, another new word that is added. 1020, somebody read it. Many of them said, Many of them said He is demon possessed. He is demon possessed and raving mad. And is raving mad. Demon possessed. Now the, now the added thing is he is demon possessed and mad. Oh God, how many more epithets is Satan going to bring? How you know you can see how Satan would like to completely sort of strip him of any, uh, any respect whatsoever. You're a demon, demon possessed. We are rightly saying that you're a Samaritan and you're mad and so on and so forth. And then it goes on. And then you will read in other portions of scripture that even his own disciples and family didn't believe on him. What a sad thing. Oh God, wait a minute. I've got another angle. Now you would say, if I, if I had a gun, I would go there and shoot all those guys down. No, don't do that. The Lord Jesus himself made himself little. Give me a verse for that. Somebody give me a verse. Can you remember anything at all? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 what? He grew up like a tree. He was despised and rejected by men. He was despised, but I'm saying he did it to himself. Okay. All right, I'll give you the verse. And if you want, you put it down. One of the messianic psalms, when you say messianic, you mean that that psalm speaks about Christ. Okay, that's as simple as that. One of the messianic psalms is Psalm 22. You know how it begins? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that's the word he spoke on the cross, did he not? That's the word he spoke. And when he was on the cross, somewhere in the middle of the six hours, Suddenly there was darkness, and at that point of time he said, My God, and my, oh, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And people say that the Jewish people, the Jews, they learned the scriptures by heart. And suppose they learned Psalm 22 by heart, they would say the first word aloud, and they would say the last line aloud. So the first line is what? My God. My God, why hast thou forsaken? The last line is, he has done it. Now put it in other words, put it in the mouth of Christ, what will you get? It is finished. You see what I mean? So it would seem as if when the Lord Jesus was on the cross, the words of Psalm 22 were going through his mind. And he said that, that verse, the first verse, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me at the point of time when all your sins were laid upon him? And the father turned his face away from him. And then at the end he says, it is finished. Thank God, isn't it? He said that. Now, in verse 6, there's a very significant verse. He's speaking, and what does he say in verse 6? Somebody read quickly. Okay, okay. But I'll tell it to you in my version. But I am a worm. Christ is speaking. He says, I am a worm and no man. Now nobody's belittling him. He is saying it of himself. 
I'm not the mighty conqueror, the king of kings, the lord of all. No, not all of that. I am a worm and no man. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine how much he must have loved you? How much he must have loved you to lay aside every bit of glory and now talk of himself as he writhed on the cross in pain. He says, I am a worm and no man. I don't look like a man. All right, everybody turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I'll keep waiting till you get your page. Philippians chapter 2. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And all of us, if it's possible, if you could remember the word said, otherwise if you've got a Bible, read it carefully together from verse 5, okay? Verse 5. And in between I'm going to stop now and again and say something. Now read from verse 5, everybody. Okay, that's verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. What kind of a mind did he have? Verse 6. Okay, now wait a minute. I'll say something about it. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, something to be grasped at, to be equal with God. Why? Because he is God. Why would he want to be something that he's all, he is already? He, said, he didn't think it. Thing. Satan thought it a thing, a robbery to, to sit on the right hand of God. He wanted to sit there. Satan thinks of it like he wanted to grab it. Christ, he says, he didn't think it a thing to be grasped at or to rob it, to be equal with God. And the next line says, Rather, he made himself nothing. In some of your Bible, it says he made himself of no reputation. He made himself nothing. If you're reading the Hindi Bible, you know what it says? He made himself shunya. What is shunya? Zero. Zero. What is he actually? Come on, tell me. Don't say all that. You're talking about zero, no? What is he? Number one. You almost go back to kindergarten or something. Man. I don't know what this is. I mean, if that is zero, this has got to be number one. He is number one. Say amen or something. Amen. He is number one. And he made himself zero. He stepped, stepped aside and became what? Nothing. Can you imagine that? Not he became small. He not he became less than anybody else. Nor even a ten times smaller, uh, what, what do you call it? Not even ten times nearer the Caesar of that day. Nothing of that sort. He became Nothing. Oh God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Go on, next line. And took upon him the form of a, a servant. Mind you, I'm not talking about a man now. Straight away he goes to what? He took upon him the form of a servant or a slave. And then was made in the likeness of men. He took the form of a servant. Not even just a servant, a paid servant, that kind of a thing. But a slave. You got no face, you got no name, you got no dignity, you got nothing. Took the form of a slave. And made himself. What? And then what does it say? Being found and him. being found. Watch it carefully, everybody. Yes. Read it. And being found in, in fashion as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself. Now, wait a minute. I read that word himself earlier. What was that himself? 
He made himself nothing. And now what does it say? He humbled himself. You get what I mean? Now the Lord did that. The king of kings is doing that. He humbled himself. And he became nothing. He made himself nothing. He humbled himself. And became obedient. Unto my brothers and sisters. You've got a Bible. If you want to be obedient. If you, you want to please God. You got to obey the word of God. And I tell you, even if you obey the word of God, it's a sign that you are humbling yourself. You get what I mean? I'm not asking you if you know the word of God. I'm not asking you if you, you know it by heart. I'm not asking you if you know the, all the dictionary and the spellings. Forget about that. But do you obey it? Every line of it. Don't argue with God. The, when, you, when you read the word of God, who's speaking? Tell me. God is speaking. When you pray, who's speaking? You're speaking. Isn't that right? So when you go to prayer, give more time to, for him to speak to you than for you to speak to him. It is for more important that he gets through to you through the word than you get through to him with your prayers. And you, we struggle with all kinds of cliches and other things, trying to impress the heavens. Forget about that. Oh, that you and I might be those who will shed tears. Humble ourselves. He humbled himself and became obedient. What comes first? Humbled himself and became obedient. What comes first? Humility. Humility. What's next? Obedience. Obedience. Even the death of the cross. Now everybody say together, wherefore? What, what's your word there? Therefore? therefore where? All right. Therefore, God, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above Every name, that at the, uh, whether things in heaven or things on earth, things under the earth, above every name, and that at the name of Jesus. What? Every knee? Wait, 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 wait. Every knee means Jack who lives next door to you. Who does it mean? Who, when you say everyone, who does it mean? Huh? Eh? Come on, somebody give me the right word. When you say everybody, you're including yourself. It's me. Oh God. Oh God. That every, uh, every knee, my knee, shall bow. And every tongue, whose tongue? My tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You understand me? You know some years ago, sorry for keeping you standing for a little while. If you want, you can sit down. But just another minute, okay? So years ago, one lady, missionary, Celeste Hull by name, I kept saying, Jesus, Jesus, you know, in my preaching and all that. And I thought I was very familiar with Jesus, so just called him Jesus. Jesus. She took me aside and having a cup of tea, she says, I, very nice of you to call him Jesus and mention the name, but do you know that he's your Lord? Too many people, even in their prayer, they end their prayer, we ask in the name of Jesus. Okay, who is he? Come on, say, say, who is he? Jesus. Christ the Lord. Don't feel ashamed. If a Hindu person, uh, or you know, from those from the Hindu uh, background, if they were to talk about their God, let's say Krishna, and he's talking to me, he won't say, Krishna, sweet Krishna. He would, he would refer to his Krishna as Lord Krishna. Agreed with me? They would do that, and the real one who is really Lord, you don't call him Lord. And Satan is the one who is comfortable. 
for heaven's sake, refer to him as Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father God, thank you that the Lord Jesus is our Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that right here you are standing in our midst, Lord Jesus. If only you opened our eyes, we would see you. We may not be able to stand the glory, but Lord, there's a day coming. Very soon you're coming back and we shall see you face to face. Oh God, bless every brother and sister standing here in your midst. Every family, every husband and wife, every young person. Oh God, grant that there might be a growing intimacy between you and each individual believer over here. If there's anybody here who does not know Christ as their personal savior, oh God, even today, grant that the spirit of God would work in that heart. And, and the young person would accept the Lord Jesus as savior. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you, Lord, Father God. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you, Lord, Father, for speaking to us, Lord. Father God, Lord, we are blessed. And, Lord, we are privileged to be in your presence, Lord, to hear your words, Lord. Father says that you have said in Isaiah, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing that it I sent it, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us. We are blessed, so blessed, to see you and to be reminded who you are. You became nothing for us. You are everything, and yet you became nothing. Oh, Lord, help us to humble ourselves. Thank you for speaking to us. And we know, Lord, that what you have spoken to us today, it will not go empty. May it bear much fruit in our lives, oh, Lord. And, Lord, help us to praise you and rejoice. We come before you, Lord. Help us to worship you.
are my wind defense, you are my righteousness. We confess, we need you, Lord. We confess you. We are redeemed by you. We need you, Lord.
saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I am found was blind but now I see oh Lord we are blind Lord Father without you send your Holy Spirit Lord to revive in us Lord Father God revive our soul our spirits Lord may we sing to you Lord may we walk in obedience to you Lord we thank you Father we thank you for your amazing grace As long as life. 
Lay aside the 